Hi, good evening everyone. Welcome to uh, tonight's episode of the TV show. Tonight I am joined by National Tournament Director Fide Arbiter, Fide International Organizer and current member of the US Chess Rules Committee, Al Losoff. Uh, Alan, uh, good evening. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you, Chris? Great, thank you. Nice of you to join us. Uh, Alan, for those who don't know you, uh, which I'm sure is few and uh, far between, You've been um, the organizer of the Las Vegas International Chess Festival, or National Open, I believe since 1991. Uh, yes. I, that, that's uh, quite a few years, and that's uh, where, where I met you and, and got to know you pretty well. Um, you're also, uh, like I said, I think uh, vice chair of the Rules Committee right now, and you've been previously chair of the Rules Committee before. Correct. And uh, I, I know you've organized many, uh, I guess, national scholastic events before U.S. Chess uh, took those over and been involved with many national events, U.S. Opens, etc. Uh, over your time. So it's a very, we're very glad to have you here on board uh, to give us a brief introduction. How, how you got into being a TD in the first place? Well, about 50 years ago, uh, when I lived in Minnesota, there was met some people and they were running tournaments and I got interested and uh, the first large tournament I ran was a uh, I ran it with David Coons up in Minnesota and we ran a, a tournament with over three thousand dollar prize money now this was the same year as the first world open the world open had a fifteen thousand dollar prize fund so yeah. three thousand was pretty respectable at that time yeah exactly all right and um uh, that's great. And uh, for those who don't know us, um, tonight's uh, topic uh, that Alan so graciously chose for us um, is the TD, the tournament director. And there is actually a section in the rule book, section 21, that covers all about the, T uh, the tournament director. So let's get into that now and get the uh, program started. So we'll switch over here. And the first thing we're going to show you is um, 21A which is the chief tournament director. And uh, every tournament needs a chief tournament director. It has to have one. Someone has to take uh, ultimate responsibility for the event. And the chief tournament director is responsible for all play. And the tournament director must see that the rules are observed. That seems pretty simple. Uh, I, I don't think there's uh, any, any way of stating that more clearer. Uh, director is bound by the official rules of chess, by US chess tournament rules. Code of Ethics, and all U.S. chess procedures and policies. Well, uh, okay, if you're going to run U.S. chess rated events, you're bound by the U.S. chess rules, and the tournament director has to oversee and make sure those rules are observed. Sounds pretty simple so far. Uh, what are the duties and powers of a tournament director? Well, tournament director can appoint assistants uh, to help him or her uh, do whatever they need to do to ensure that the tournament is run uh, via the rules. Um, accept and list entries. Uh, that's not necessarily take entries. We'll cover that a little later on. That's where Alan's uh, um, another um, aspect of Alan's expertise comes into play on the organizer side. Um, provide suitable conditions of play. Now, Alan, uh, I think as the organizer, you're you're sort of partially responsible for for that as well. But uh, once you get into the event, the tournament director sees uh, that the conditions of play as suitable uh, and acceptable. Would you agree with that? Yes, sometimes sometimes it involves hitting the organizer over the head with a two by four. <laughs> it, is, it is necessary. Which, which I try not to do. And uh, also um, familiarize players with the playing facility and other tournament conditions. Uh, I think we had Tim just on last week uh, talking about signage. Uh, that's a really good way to uh, familiarize that. Alan, you take care of that via uh, the website for the event as well. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, making sure everyone knows where to turn up, which room to uh, register at, uh, where the playing hall is, various things along those lines. And then uh, prepare parents. The tournament director does that. Uh, big events like the National Open, uh, the chief tournament director, who I was last year, um, I, you know, was able to appoint an assistant, uh, as the rules state, to, to do that for me. Uh, but overall responsibility uh, still lies with me. And then uh, display wall charts. Well, that, that, that comes with parents. People need to know uh, who they're going to play and where they find the wall charts, which are the uh, standings for the tournament. And then to rule on disputes and enforce such rulings. It, it 
all seems fairly simple uh, so far what the TD uh, is, is supposed to do at these events. If someone makes a claim, you uh, rule on that claim and you enforce such rulings per the rulebook. Uh, duties and powers continued. Um, I like this. Um, so this one here, if anyone didn't think we were ever an entertainment show, I think this um, um, wording of this specific uh, piece of the rules um, is just for that um, entertainment value. Um, I'm not quite sure English comes into this. Collect scores, report results, and forward US chess and membership applications. Um, possibly an and in there somewhere that shouldn't be in there. Tournament results and fees to the sponsoring organization and for the official record. Alan, I know you've been involved with the rules committee for quite a while. Um, any any thoughts on <laughs> on the wedding? I think it's trying to tell me. I, I, I've never noticed that, but I, I suspect you're right. I suspect that uh, that's actually an editorial issue. The, the and between chess and membership probably uh, do, doesn't belong there. Or, or right. uh, I think what it's trying to say is we collect. Um, U.S. chess memberships as part of uh, collecting scores, with reporting results, um, and we we give the fees to you as a sponsoring organization. Like you know, I would give them to national, uh, you know, to the National Open, um, and then you know they would obviously pass that on to U.S. chess in terms of rating fees and stuff, or membership fees collected, etc. Um, and for the official record, I guess that once once that gets up uh, online on MSA, that's the official record for the event uh, from the U.S. chess for rating. Um, perspective that's what i think it's trying to say yeah I, um, I i i suspect if we look at some of the old rule books we'll see there was something of that and right there were um forward us chess something <laughs> and membership application there used right. to be uh, uh i know we in the, in the old days we used to mail the wall charts right so exactly um, so anyway, let's uh, get on to uh, move to the next one. Twenty one C is delegation of duties, and like uh, I said, Chris, Chris, yep. back up one moment to the other yep. slide. Sure. One thing that's important for the tournament directors to recognize is the tournament director, by signing off on the tournament, is responsible, and sometimes that creates a difficulty, and you have to really push the organizer. If you've turned everything over to the organizer, and three weeks later the event is not rated. It's still your responsibility uh, to make sure the organizer gets those fees in and yep. uh, contact yeah. U.S. Chess if there's an issue, right. uh, 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 a financial issue or whatever that's holding it up. Uh, it's your responsibility to, as the tournament director, to make sure that yeah. that all gets processed. Yeah, as it says, report results uh, right there. Um, so, yeah, no, you're right. And I think we cover a little bit of that in, when, we, when we talk about the TD and the organizer relationship a little later on. Um, so delegation of duties, the chief director may delegate any duties to assistants, but is not thereby relieved of responsibility for performance of these. So that means um, even though you, you have tournament directors helping you, you know, doing pairings, various things, as the chief tournament director, um, you're, you're basically uh, take responsibility for anything they do. Um, a lot of you know little club events will only have one tournament director, the chief tournament director. So you're obviously responsible for what you do yourself. Uh, but at some of these big events, um, there is a, a, a chain of command there, and the chief the chief tournament director usually the book uh, stops with them. So, uh, so what can a TD do? So this is um, to me uh, the interesting part of this um, uh, whole rule set, Alan, and I, I think. Uh, Prior to uh, you, you determining you wanted to cover this particular topic, I said this is the contentious one. Um, so for coming from the FIDE world, uh, the FIDE world um, clearly states that you 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 know you observe uh, that the rules are enforced uh, most of the times at least, um, and it's very hands on. Whereas people think that the U.S. chess world, the tournament director is a little more hands off, and it probably is the case. But I don't think you have to be as hands off as some people. Uh, make it seem and we'll, hopefully we'll cover um, some of that now and um, and and hopefully dispel a little bit of that myth at least uh, but we'll we'll see how this goes so the first thing that um, it, it says is intervening in game so this is talking about when a tournament director 
um, is allowed to intervene in games, not must intervene in games, um, but can intervene in games in the following situations. Um, answering rules questions, that seems pretty straightforward. If someone asks you a question on a rule, um, you, you can answer that question uh, legitimately. You, um, any suggestions on how to do that, Al? Alan, maybe, maybe if it's something related to the game, it might be worthwhile getting the opponent there. If, uh, if necessary, if you feel that the opponent should also have that information too. Uh, but a lot of times, if players have a rules question, they'll step away from the game while it's not their move, come over to the tournament director and just ask them, um, you know, uh, some, some sort of question. Um, and, and, I, you know, and, and it's in the rule book that uh, you're allowed to answer those rules and procedural questions. Any thoughts on that, Alan? No, just um, ju just making sure that your answer is not in some way um, uh, directly helping or 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 uh, uh, and is, is strictly rules. If somebody asks, uh, "When can I offer a draw?" You can answer that question. If he asks, "Can I offer a draw right now?" You can't answer that one. Um, so moving on to the next one, um, I, we covered this a couple of weeks ago when we did illegal moves. So correcting illegal moves that are observed. Um, so remember the main rule is that you will correct illegal moves if you observe them, um, unless time pressure exists. Uh, the variation, 11H1, um, is the one that states the director doesn't correct any illegal moves um, and is primarily the variation that's used. I, I, we definitely use that at the National Open. Um, there's just too many games to be watching, so we don't feel it's fair to correct illegal moves in some and not in others. And so we uh, use the variation. Um, but a director can uh, intervene in a game and correct an illegal move if, if they observe that. And then the fun one, I think, uh, warning players. Um, warning players about or penalizing players for disruptive, unethical, or unsportsmanlike behavior. Um, and this, in, in my eyes, covers a world of um, scenarios. Um, if someone's cheating, um, can you intervene? Absolutely. Uh, you would consider that unethical. Uh, if someone's been disruptive, disturbing a lot of games, etc., you can inter you know, intervene there as well. Uh, unsportsmanlike behavior. I think a lot of things come under unsportsmanlike behavior, and you can definitely intervene in some of those areas too. Um, so this is what I would... Uh, consider the uh, the catch-all um, so um, for, for me to to intervene in a situation where some feel maybe the rules don't allow them because TDs are meant to be very hands-off but if you catch a player cheating or doing something they shouldn't be doing um, the, the rules definitely state that you can step in and warn them about that or penalize players for for doing various things that they shouldn't be doing any, uh, I, I know you've been on the rules committee for a while, Alan, and I'm sure this is um, usually a hot topic um, as, yeah. as to whether a tournament director can intervene or not. Any any sort of uh, guidance from from the powers that be here? Uh, well, in general, the the uh, um, as as you say here, unethical, disruptive, um, anything that that. Um, might not be known to the opponent um, if if the uh, uh, if, if the player is standing behind another player and making faces and it's annoying somebody uh, the other player doesn't know that but you can step in if um, uh, the other thing to consider though is you could have competition rules for your particular uh, event um, but even at that I think these three uh, these three uh, categories, you would step in no matter how strict your non-interference rules were for your competition. Yeah, and, and I um, definitely, when I'm chief tournament director at some of these big events, um, if, if a tournament director steps in uh, and corrects one of these uh, issues, and for some reason the players all feel that they shouldn't have, and it, and it makes it up the ladder to me, um, you know, it, this is um, usually I will back the tournament director uh, on, on stepping in for, for any of these. And the rules clearly back uh, the tournament director up on stepping in on any of those points. So don't be so hands off. Be hands on. Um, 
make make the uh, tournament the best you can for all the players possible. And uh, you know, if you need to correct uh, some sort of some sort of disruptive behavior or deal with something that's going on, um, the rules state clearly state that you don't need a claim for that to happen. Uh, you can step in and take care of it yourself. And I'm sure everyone else around would appreciate that uh, happening too. Uh, there are some other uh, areas where you can intervene in games. Uh, let's have a look at those. Um, settling disputes. Uh, you obviously have to settle a dispute, uh, including those regarding time forfeits and claims of draws. Uh, so usually if there's a dis dispute, someone makes a claim, the other player doesn't agree with it, that's a dispute. You get the tournament director, you go in there and deal with those. Uh, informing players, informing players about opponents late arrival or about opponents leaving the room for an extended period. Um, so you can definitely, if an opponent comes, you know, if a player comes to you and says, hey, I need to run to the bathroom, it might be a little while, you can definitely tell his opponent that that's going to happen, um, you know, if, uh, especially if they start asking about it. Um, if an opponent's going to be not there for 45 minutes, but you know they're coming, uh, you can definitely tell the player that uh, if you feel they should have that information. Uh, and fees, collecting fees. So you can, who knew, you can intervene in a game to collect fees. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, usually, if the membership is outstanding, uh, we will, at towards the start of the game, give them a little slip saying, hey, you are uh, the US Chess membership. At some stage, after your game is finished, go to the registration desk and pay that. Uh, that would be appreciated, uh, that type of thing. So, But um, we are allowed by the rules to do that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so moving on, uh, swiftly. Uh, we wanted to cover, so uh, just going back a, a little bit, that, uh, in a nutshell, is uh, the chief tournament director and the tournament directors and their duties, obligations to the tournament, and, and where they're allowed to... Um, interject themselves into games uh, or into uh, situations going on and it, it seems pretty clear um, and sort of mainly plain uh, of what you're meant to do and, and what you're not meant to do. Um, so the other thing we wanted to cover here uh, was the playing director as part of the rules. So a lot of club events, the chief tournament director uh, may need to step in and actually play or if they weren't um, hosting the event and playing in the event, they wouldn't get to play chess themselves um, ever because they'd be busy just being a tournament director. Not a lot of fun for them, uh, potentially. So US chess rules do allow for a tournament director to participate in, in certain events. Um, it, it, here's um, how you meant to do it. Uh, you must be able to devote full attention to directing duties. Um, so you should not you know, they don't want you to play in it, but you can. Um, however, uh, if it's a US Chess National event, a director cannot be a playing director. Um, and here we go about the uh, smaller club events. Uh, director can also serve as a house player. Um, you should be careful to maintain objectivity. And uh, if possible, uh, if you have that luxury, uh, should there be a ru ruling to make on your own game, as a tournament director, um, you should have another director make that ruling. Um, not everybody has that luxury. Just be as objective as you can. Um, you have a lot on the line, obviously, if you're making a ruling in your own game. Um, last thing you want is that ruling to be appealed and it to make its way elsewhere because you weren't um, playing fair or being impartial in your own game. And then last but not least, um, uh, if you must get involved in a dispute in another game, uh, the US Chess rules do allow you to stop your clock while you do that. Uh, and while the clock is stopped, the director should not look at the position of his or her own, uh, own game, uh, but your opponent is allowed to do so. So, so you're not getting any benefit from um, taking care of the, an issue in another game, uh, but your opponent can because they can look at the game while the clock is stopped. However, you can stop the clock to go and deal with a dispute in another game. All seems fairly simple. Um, so let's just cover really quickly um, the tournament director uh, against the organizers. So for those who don't know, um, I myself has been a tournament director and the chief tournament director at the National Open uh, a couple of times. Um, and Alan is, as we know, the organizer of the National Open, the Las Vegas International Chess Festival. 
uh, which incidentally has been rescheduled for September 16th to the 20th. Alan, is that correct? Correct. Correct. So look out for that uh, announcement coming soon. I think it's our, the website's already up and, and everything is yes. uh, up and running. Chestnut so, Vegas. Chess.Vegas. I think that's slightly different from the, what it was uh, for, the, for the original date. Yeah. But um, so Alan and I can bring together, uh, because we've been the chief tournament director and the chief organizer, uh, we figured it would be good to cover some of the aspects that we go through um, together um, as uh, chief TD and organizer, and um, the things that we talk about prior to, to the event. So what does the tournament director do versus the tournament organizer? Well, we've, we've already seen that the tournament director oversees all the play and, and make sure all the rules are, are enforced. Uh, we're responsible for all the pairings, wall charts and various things. Uh, rulings, I, I said, so um, tournament director um, or my um, you know, assistants cover those rulings, um, playing conditions. Um, so again, uh, this is, probably means playing conditions while the event is going on as opposed to playing conditions prior, but we get in there a couple of days early and, and make sure everything is set up correctly for when the players arrive. Um, and then actually I supervise the TD staff too. So. Um, you know, we'd have a huge team of uh, tournament directors that come in and help put on the national open each year. Um, and they, they do need overseeing and as part of my role as a chief tournament director and pair the rules. Um, you know, I, I'm responsible for those people. Alan, as the tournament organizer, uh, I think is, that's a very, very short list of the things I think that you do. Uh, would you care to run through? Oh, that pretty much everything's covered in there but yes um i think that covers everything there some of those categories are pretty wide yes so planning the tournament so planning the tournament includes everything from obviously uh coming up with the idea of the event um coming up with time controls you know the format of the tournament um uh, sections uh, when the event you know schedule um prize money entry fees um, everything along that, you know, that, that, well, that and arranging the site is yes, the difficult parts of that. Yep. Um, especially if you all of a sudden have to reschedule something on short notice. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as you do. Um, and then the tournament organizer is also responsible for arranging equipment if any is provided. Some events say it's up to the players to bring their own um, board, set, clock, etc. Um, at the National Open, we have the luxury of having sets and pieces provided for all the players. Uh, they just have to bring a clock. Um, so that, that's really good. Uh, but any other equipment as well. Uh, if we're doing a live broadcast, all the DGG equipment. Um, I know that we have games shown on the stage, which may not happen for this next event due to some issues. But uh, any sort of equipment, um, computer equipment uh, for running the back room, uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that the organizer is ultimately um, responsible for. Um, actually hiring the staff. So um, as a tournament director, I get, uh, you know, and we'll go over this, uh, uh, I think on the next slide um, uh, where we work together, but the, the ultimate responsibility for hiring the staff themselves um, is, is, uh, is, is that of the organizer, they pay them. Um, advertising the website, I. You know, as a tournament director, I help with that. Any event that hires me, um, I'm, I'm happy to advertise their web, uh, you know, their event. Um, and, uh, but the organizer usually puts that stuff together, uh, taking entries, um, so US chess memberships, uh, paying prizes, um, you know, all of that is the tournament organizer's responsibility. Um, in terms of prizes, uh, as Ernie Schlick is pointing out in the chat there, um, usually it's the tournament director that actually calculates the prize that each player would get uh, but actually in terms of paying those prizes it would be the organizer so there's uh, one little bit of working together that we we normally do um, and then just quickly um, it's very important that the tournament director or the chief tournament director at least and the organizer uh, we've got to communicate those responsibilities and expectations before we actually agree on um, taking that position. So the organizer will come to the chief tournament director and say, Chris, I want to hire you to be the chief tournament director. 
I'll turn around, you know, I'll turn around to her and say, okay, what do you want me to do? What do you expect out of me? Let's get all that worked out before I put my signature on the dotted line. We agree on all this beforehand, and then uh, hopefully everything runs smoothly from there on. Uh, as we know from experience, it doesn't always necessarily work out that way. Things have to change on the fly a little bit. We both have to be very flexible when it comes to all of this, uh, all of this stuff. But uh, we we make it work, and we make it work very well. So, uh, but we we definitely talk about this type of stuff uh, before we actually um, agree um, to to um, do the event together. And then uh, there are uh, even though we had the previous list, which gave a separation of um, sort of duties what each uh, the TD and the organizer is responsible for. Um, we work together on a lot of issues, Alan, right? You would agree with that? Oh, yeah. We, we, we have, well, for something as big as the National Open, we have uh, frequent Zoom meetings with, with uh, each other and some of the other TDs for a more reasonably sized event. There wouldn't be quite as much uh, interaction necessary, but everything does have to be covered. Yes. And, and here are some examples. So setting tournament specific policies, um, such as default time, spectator policies, uh, what are the buys, assigning ratings to players. Um, you know, there are, there are rules um, that you follow in, in terms of some of this stuff, but there are, there are, some of the rules are flexible and you can announce your own variations to those. At National Open, our default time is 30 minutes, as opposed to the standard US chess um, default time. Um, you know, Alan um, says, I, I want anyone to be able to have a buy in any round. And I say, I don't like that. And between the two of us, anyone can get a buy in any round. And then uh, assigning ratings, ratings to player, um, you know, that, that falls to me as a, as a tournament director to do that. But Alan can come up with the policies on how we do those, like converting foreign ratings and various things along those lines. So it's all working together. We come on agreements to all of this, and Alan usually gets his way. Is that right? <laughs> well, that's just because usually we agree on what the right way is. Exactly. Normally, whatever you suggest is not too outlandish, so I'm normally happy to go with it. Um, determining advertising on tournament format, schedule, time controls. We definitely talk about all that. Um, if I think Alan is trying to you know, I, I think, uh, you know, let's pull the plug on the one day schedule, Alan. I don't think that's going to quite work, but we'll, I'll happily do a four day, three day and a two day schedule and we'll make that work. Uh, time controls, various things. I have to advise Alan because um, uh, we have FIDE rated sections. I have to advise him on what the minimums are for that, what can be allowed, etc. Make sure everything uh, meets with the rules and regulations. We work out the staffing requirements. Uh, I give Alan a uh, a long list of the people I want to work the events. Alan cuts those down a little bit uh, as he has to be fiscally responsible and I sort of don't. So, um, you know, between the two of us, we, we get a list of people that we want to work the event. Uh, we have a great team at the National Open um, who I love to work with. Um, but, um, you know, between the two of us, we decide who's gonna be on staff, who we can afford, um, various things along those lines. Um, checking advertisements in the website, uh, not really the tournament director's thing, but it, you know, it's good for the organizer to send everything to the tournament director who should know what the event is about, uh, you know, and various things and can quickly eyeball any glaring errors. Uh, that, that's all just useful stuff. I, I, I would interject here that that is very important when you're working with an organizer, uh, because I've been on both ends of that. When you're, um, you know, uh, if you're directing a tournament for the U.S. Chess Federation or for me or for Continental Chess, they have an automated online system where the entries go directly into the pairing program. Uh, I've worked with another organizer who personally enters everything into Swissys and hands me a Swissys file when I arrive on site. Right. Those systems work well, and what he posts on the website is exactly what's in the Swissys file. Um, I won't name any very, very extremely large prize fund chess tournaments. But there was one chess tournament I was associated with where the organizer insisted on his own method of accepting entries, did them in an Excel spreadsheet, and turned the spreadsheet over to the backroom chief um, at the beginning of the tournament. 
And it was not until the second round that it was correct that the fact that he had turned over the wrong spreadsheet was corrected. If the, it's very important that what's on the website is exactly what's going into the pairing program. And the only way to ensure that is with the software posting it directly. So um, uh, one of the other things we talk about is equipment needs, who's bringing computers, printers, pairing software to be used, various things. Um, usually Alan provides everything at National Open. I'm very spoiled that way. Uh, but you know, I bring my own computer and various things. Um, yeah, I, I don't need for much at the National Open, uh, which is great. But sometimes, um, you know, a, a smaller event, there could just be a couple of people, uh, a couple of TDs. One of them is the organizer between the two of you. You might uh, need to both bring a computer to run pairings, printers, various things. So just, just talk about those needs. And then as Alan was talking about the website updates for entries, pairings, results, standings, very, very important to get all that um, set up uh, correctly. Um, usually the organizer will take care of that stuff, but um, sometimes the organizer will ask the chief tournament director to look after that aspect of things for them. Um, there are various systems out there now, online um, services that offer um, things like taking entries uh, for you, etc. Uh, but once the event's going, um, obviously, you know, pairings, results, standings, and various things, uh, become the, the tournament's responsibility from that point on. So we, we talk about that, we uh, work on that together. Um, I know Alan is very conscientious that the website uh, information for the National Open is accurate. Um, all those ratings you know, are, are checked by the uh, Chief Tournament Director uh, to make sure everyone's uh, playing where they should be, very simple on those lines. We try and keep all that as up to date as possible. So we, we work hand in hand on that stuff. So that's just some of the stuff yeah, press on and the important yep. thing from the standpoint of this session and yep. for the TD to be aware of is just that it's the TD's responsibility to coordinate with the organizer and make sure the organizer is giving him or her what is needed. What they need. And exactly. That's just important. Yep, for sure. Yeah, so as the TD, um, you, there are various things you need to ask of the organizer. You know, you need to make sure that the organizer has done what they need to do. Um, because it, it will definitely make your life easier. The last thing you want to do is get to an event and find out the organizer has not done um, some of the stuff that they should have been doing. And, um, you know, and then you're, you're sort of out on a limb a little bit and you're having to uh, fight fires rather than just get there, uh, get the tournament set up and just run it uh, smoothly. Um, so, you know, take care of that as a TD and, and definitely stay on your organizer uh, if need be. And, it, and then it makes you look like you're actually doing your job as well. So, All right. Now, uh, I think that has covered everything that we're going to um, cover in terms of the actual TD, uh, what, um, you know, what is expected of the TD, and a brief little bit about the TD versus the organizer, since we had Alan and, uh, and, and we worked together at National Open. So I know, I know you've all been waiting for the trivia. Um, Alan and I worked through the trivia a little earlier. I'll explain right now that some of the answers are not necessarily as clear as they could be, but I, I think uh, we'll, we're going to have a, hopefully an interesting conversation about some of the trivia here um, and, and my feelings on them, Alan's feelings on the right answers, and, and we'll see if we can work this all out together. So anyway, let's, let's get this set up. Uh, I need to do a couple of things here. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and, and open this up for answers. So trivia question one. Um, as a tournament director, you witness a player analyzing a game in the Skittles room with his friends. So he's there in the Skittles room and just going over a game with his friends. Um, his game being played in the main playing room is still in progress. Uh, what do you do? Uh, would you want do nothing? Uh, as a TD, can't get involved in the game without a complaint from the opponent. Would you too uh, quickly look to see if the position matches his game if it doesn't um, if it doesn't leave him alone uh, let him continue to hang out with his friends um, would you three tell the player to leave the skittle room and reserve judgment on a penalty until you've compared the analyzed game to the game in progress or would you four just forfeit the player uh, immediately uh, so we've got some uh, answers coming in the in the chat right now uh, which is very good 
Uh, I know we we spoke about this. Uh, I think we were we were half on one and half on another, and uh, you know we we were. Um, I think one answer could lead to a, lead to another answer, uh, depending on the right thing. So let's go ahead and close this off right now. We we got some votes in. That's uh, really good. Um, Al, we got eighty percent of people uh, voted for three, and twenty percent of people voted for four. Um, and we spoke about this earlier. What would you What would you do, Al? Well, I'd, I'd go with three, but I wouldn't fault anyone who picked four. And uh, that's a little harsh. It depends on. Uh, sometimes there might be other circumstances. Certainly, if it's a player who's done this before, I jump to four right away. Um, but uh, generally, uh, I would I would give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, uh, and that's pretty much the conclusion that you and I came to when we discussed it. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think I would go for three as well. You want as much information as possible before you go forfeiting someone. That's that's my thing. Um, so uh, definitely get them out of the Skittles room. Uh, that's the first thing to do. Um, march them back to their board. Um, you might want to, you know, if you can memorize the position that was in the Skittles room or something similar to it, um, obviously if they're analyzing their game, uh, it has to lead to number four eventually. Uh, but if they're just doing something stupid, hanging out in the Skittles room, playing with friends while the game's going on, um, you know, you'll still want to probably penalize them, but your your penalty may be a little less severe than actually forfeiting them. So I would go with three, and it may eventually lead to four. Uh, let's move to question two. Another fun one. Uh, you witness a player pick up a piece um, put it back down on the same square and then complete a move using a totally different piece. Uh, the opponent is not at the board, so the opponent did not see this happening, but you as the tournament director did. Uh, what would you do? Let me go ahead and, uh, oops, let's open this up before someone types an answer. Uh, would you one, do nothing? The tournament director can't get involved in a game without a complaint from the opponent. Two, when the opponent returns, stop the clock, inform the opponent what happened and let him decide whether to make a claim. Would you three, stop the clock, inform the player that you saw him touch the other piece, so he must move it, and then add two minutes to the opponent's clock? Or would you four, stop the clock, inform the player that you saw him touch the other piece, and question what other pieces he may have touched prior to making his move, and in what order? Um, he will then have to make a move in accordance with the touch move rule, and add two minutes to the opponent's clock. So we have one answer in the chat already. And again, we were, Alan and I uh, are, like I said, some of these questions are a little um, not easy. Um, and, and there are reasons for our answers. Um, <laughs> so uh, well, yeah, only, well, only one person has, has braved it uh, enough to get nice an answer. It isn't a problem because looking at the users who are logged in here, um, I don't see one who's less qualified than either you or I. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. At least among the names I recognize. Yep. So yeah, I see David Hitter in there, Andy Schlick is in there. Hmm. And this is a great conversation uh, question, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, everyone will have their own um, opinion on this. And what you, what you feel is right by the rules, um, you know, uh, I, as long as it... You know, well, my, my thing about the ruling is you make a ruling as long as it holds upon appeal, uh, let's go with it. Um, so uh, already between three, uh, at least uh, three national tournament directors, uh, maybe possibly four, um, we, we've got a difference of opinion already. So let's go ahead and close off the poll. And uh, I, I would also point out that when Chris and I discussed it, between the two of us, we did have three opinions. <laughs> yes. So anyway, so uh, three was the most popular answer with 50%. And, and somebody went for one and somebody went for two. And so uh, I'll, I'll start off by saying nobody went for the answer that I would have given. <laughs> so I, I personally would have gone for four. Uh, just, you know, I, just because you saw him touch that piece uh, doesn't necessarily mean that was the first piece he touched. I know that could open up a line of uh, him sort of getting out of it uh, by insisting the, the piece that he moved was actually, in fact, the piece he, he moved, uh, he touched first. Um, you know, if, if anyone thinks that quickly and that sharply on it, then so be it. 
But um, I would definitely um, at least step in and inform the player that you saw him touch the other piece. And I, I think in most instances, they're, they're going to go ahead and move that piece. Um, but I would definitely ask him because you, I don't think there's any way, you know, number three, you can't guarantee that that was the only piece he touched, uh, especially if he's touching other pieces, um, you know, while you're watching. Uh, I, I didn't quite clarify that um, you'd seen the opponent make his move and then disappear. So you were, you were pretty certain that was the only piece he touched. Um, at which case, I would I would definitely go with number three. I think um, n number two um, it is an option. Um, I wouldn't go with it personally. I think it, it if the opponent is not there, I think this falls under unspotting unspotting behavior. You can definitely step in uh, and tell him um, to that touch move applies in this case um, because he completed the move. Um, I would definitely add two minutes to the opponent's clock as well, and then restart his clock. And make him uh, make the right move. Uh, Alan, your thoughts on this one? I think you you know well, we had a good discussion about this. There, there's one thing I would throw in is is here's where sometimes competition rules, as Fide calls them, or just tournament rules as we call them, uh, would affect. If I was directing a national scholastic, where they are very explicit in TV meetings and in the program book, the TVs don't interfere. Um, I would definitely go with one in that case. Um, and uh, again, barring anything else, barring the, the fact that this is the fourth time I saw that kid do it or something like that. Right. Um, I don't know that it's unsportsmanlike a conduct unless I've been watching the whole thing because I don't know if in fact the player picked up his rook, started to move it, put it back, and then I show up, saw him pick up the queen, realize, oh wait, I touched the rook first, put it down and move the rook. Yeah, so, and, and that was my I idea about asking what other pieces. I don't yeah. want to ask him in such a way that I'm encouraging him to lie about it. Um, uh, it's like you say, you know, uh, the, the meme that applies to very many Facebook posts, I wish I could unsee this. Um, <laughs> I would really be much happier if I hadn't seen it. Um, that said, uh, I'm and, kind of not opposed to, um, I just don't think there's a right answer, I guess. Yeah, uh, and David Hader in the chat has hit the nail on the head as well. I think we had this, uh, I mentioned this as well when we were talking. If, if the opponent was at the board, I, I wouldn't say anything either. Um, oh yeah, clearly. It, this, is, this is all about the opponent not being at the board. Um, so, in a USCF, you know, right, in a USCF tournament. Yeah, and, and definitely, um, if, if the opponent was there, I, I would leave it to the opponent to claim uh, the touch move right. or not. Um, if the opponent's not there, then I, I, I think, you know, we, we do have to give a little bit of uh, protection to him. Um, I know you said, you know, well, he, if he wants to see everything that's going on, be at the board. Uh, but, you know, I, I think as a tournament director, you can't turn a blind eye to everything uh, going on, and, and you shouldn't. Um, part of the rules, and I... I you know, I think it does fall under unspawning behavior if someone touches a piece and then moves something else and the opponent's not there. And so I, I would happily step in and feel that I would be supported fully by the rules in, in making that determination. But you know, Again, as we said, this, this is a total conversation thing and there's no right or wrong answer. I but I would feel more comfortable in the situation where you saw the entire uh, period of time when you were watching the whole time yeah. Or watching and you don't know that it's unsportsmanlike, um, my inclination is to leave it alone. Right. Um, but, so there we go. I, I told you the, the, the trivia would be fun tonight. All right, let's let's go ahead. <laughs> By the way, I would I would support um, I think I would support any one of the answers if 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 another if if I'm the floor chief and one of my floor TDs makes is in this situation, um, I would back him no matter which of these four choices he picked. Right. Okay. All right. Let's move on to question three. And uh, I think uh, someone gave this away earlier in the chat, uh, and and who knew that this one was coming? But um, question three: A player asks you to explain on person to him during his game. Uh, what do you do? Uh, do you want to explain to the player how Ampersant works but without giving reference to any specific moves? 
Two, ask the player to show you what move he intends to make and tell him if it is legal or not. Three, pass him the rule book and let him find the answer himself. Or four, just tell the player no, you can't do that. definitely have a consensus on the answer here. I think uh, you and I uh, both got this one right too, Alan, it looks like. Yeah, I guess uh, we did. <laughs> <laughs> ah, and, uh, David Hader actually had that. Yeah, and I think we've all um, at some stage possibly had something similar to this uh, pop up maybe uh, if you've been doing it for a while. So let me go ahead and close off taking the answers. And everyone will see that 100% of the people said one. Um, you know, I just thought of something, though, relating to this. Uh, the opposite situation, if the player makes the move, be it M Pisan or something else, and his opponent asked me, he just moved, pawn takes pawn, is that legal? I believe a yes or no answer is appropriate there. I wouldn't go to the, I, I wouldn't, I would not explain how M Pisan works or anything. I would think, well, I think if a player is making a legal claim, you have to rule on it as an illegal claim, right? But, but I don't think claim. he's making a legal claim. I think if a player asks well, me, is that a legal move? asking me, is that a legal move? I hope, hope he's meaning the opponent. Uh, if he's asking me if it is a legal move, if it's a legal move, the move that he intends to make, I'm not going to tell him. That, that, right, not the move he's intending to make. I'm saying the move that was just made. Uh, I would... <laughs> If the player himself is asking if the move no, he just no, made I'm, is... I'm saying oh. if I'm asking, is the move my opponent just made legal? Uh, then I think you're making an illegal move claim, and I would rule on it that way. All right. I, I can... I can <laughs> uh, okay, so let's uh, mush on to question four. And uh, let's, let's see here. And... Uh, Question four, under which circumstances can a TD get involved in a game? Can a TD get involved in a game, a game without a claim from either player? Is it one, if a player is disturbed in his own game or other games? Two, if a player has stopped writing down the moves, even though both players have more than five minutes? Three, if you notice a game where the clock does not have the five second delay set? Or four, is it all of the above? And so we've, we've been taking some, <laughs> uh, we've been taking some answers here. And uh, so we have a primarily consensus on, on one answer, but uh, Harold uh, Stenzel, I think it is National Tournament Director, Harold Stenzel uh, has a different opinion from everyone else. But uh, let's go ahead and close this, close this one off and, and show the results. So 83% of people went for four, and 16% of people went for one. And uh, Alan, I think you and I, um, again, spoke about this earlier. And I think I sort of swayed you into my answer a little bit. Yeah, I was with Harold to start with. Right. Um, but I, I believe the correct answer is four, all of the above. Um, definitely, it's, it says if a player is disturbing his own game, well, we know that's definitely covered by the rules. Um, definitely in the clock rules, it says if you notice a game that doesn't have the five second delay, it says you can, not necessarily that you must, uh, but you can definitely, it's allowed by the rules that you can get involved uh, and correct that uh, as in an erroneously set clock. And definitely by the rules, you can get involved um, on number two as well if someone stopped writing the moves, uh, even though I'm not saying that you must um, get involved with that, uh, but you can. Uh, by the rules, definitely get involved. I'm um, I'm I'm not as comfortable with two, but well, three. one of the situations I I can give an example of where I would get involved in number two, and this happens uh, definitely at the lower level of scholastics, where um, the players are um, sometimes the opponent doesn't keep score, and so there's a time deduction um, off the off the front um, end too. 
got to, um, you know, to, to cover that. So if a player's not keeping score, you take five minutes off the clock, they start the game. One guy has half an hour, the other guy has 25 minutes, something along those lines. And then I notice after a few moves that the person who was started with 30 minutes is no longer keeping score. I think at that stage, I'm definitely going to step in and tell them that they must keep score. All right, that, that um, seems... Some, something that along seems those really lines. Cool. So, um, you know, I, I, again, the wedding was can. Um, whether you would or not, um, is as, as David Hader pointed out in the chat, um, he may only get involved in number one, uh, but you definitely can get involved in all three of those situations. Well, number number three, here's what really convinced me, is not only is number three someplace I can step in, it's someplace where I routinely do, because at the very beginning of the tournament, five, ten minutes after, I walk the room and I check every clock, and uh, if the clocks are set wrong, I fix them right then, including if delay is not on. Um, if it's in time trouble is a situation where you and I discussed that you might say uh, is not appropriate to step in because we're in affecting the game. Right. Uh, but yeah, a lot that, of, I'm not so sure. Yeah, a lot of them are definitely based on the circumstances, um, for sure. So, um, I mean, you know, it was a global, can you do it? Uh, sure, you can. Uh, would you do it? Uh, possibly not as a tournament director. So, um, again, you know, it doesn't say, you know, we're not saying you must do do that. Uh, but it's definitely in the rules say, say that you can uh, get involved in those, well, those situations. I'm, I'm going to have to take this opportunity to say goodbye to everybody. And uh, okay. hope that Chris we, can finish the last 10 minutes. We just have one last trivia question. So, Alan, oh. thank you for joining us. Um, oh, we, we have this one last trivia question. Okay, I, I can stay for this. I thought, and we, instead of, I thought we were already on five. No. Nope. So uh, let me just go ahead and set the uh, poll here so people can... Uh, legitimately answer this question uh, because I'm sure everyone has a has a good uh, thing. Yeah, so let's go ahead and, and ask this question. Should the organizer make a ruling on a game if they are a certified tournament director but not officially part of the TD staff? Uh, yes, of course, they are a certified TD. Yes, the organizer is the boss. They can do what they want. No, but they should get an official TD to oversee the situation and then advise them what ruling to make. Or is it for... No, if they are not officially part of the TD staff for the event, they should not be making any rulings. And it seems we definitely have a consensus on, on the answer for this one. Alan, you had some really good points on this. Well, um, uh, again, that's because you made the explicit thing that they're not part, officially part of the TD staff. Right. There are times when the organizer is part of the TD staff, um, and and therefore, uh, or for example, in the case of the National Open, um, I am temporarily added to the TD staff when somebody needs to take a break. But exactly. other times, I would not make a ruling. Yep. And and we were saying uh, at the National Open, you your badge is double sided with the organizer and tournament director on it, and we do That's actually true. make you part of the tournament director staff if if need be. Uh, I know you're on an as-needed basis, but um, you know we have that agreement. But officially, no, the organizer themselves, even if they're a certified TD, if they're not officially part of that TD staff, they they really shouldn't be touching any of the games. Okay, well, um, if there's if there's something, me, but I do, I yep. am running over the unexpected doorbell ringing. Yeah, no worries, Alan. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, folks. That is the end of the show, anyway. Thank you for joining us. Next week we have Corey Comic coming on to join us. We're going to be talking about um, readable time controls. So that, that should be fun uh, uh, topic. So talking about uh, what time controls are, which rating system they fall under, how they advertise them, etc. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much for tuning in, folks. Uh, it's been a pleasure as usual. And we'll see you all at 9 o'clock Eastern uh, next Thursday night. Have a good